You're listening to Relentless. This is the show for high performers who are driven and committed to being at their best. Nick Peterson and Jonathan Montgomery, co-founders of Relentless Dietetics, are your hosts. Welcome to the Relentless Podcast. I'm Nick Peterson, hanging out today with Jonathan Montgomery. What is up? And the Dr. Trevor Cashy. Hello! As per usual, we're here to discuss getting a little bit better every day. Now, last week we got carried away talking about learning things, mastery, specifically to the point of practical application. Can can you use this skill in the real world to make your life better, to serve its purpose? Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's completely understandable, you know, to me anyway, that whole getting carried away thing. And, and honestly, it's pretty easy for us to do on the subject. Um, many people, but the three of us especially, I know for a fact, kind of like to dabble a little bit, like to learn and practice and, and acquire new skills that we can subsequently deploy. And, you know, this is a big part, you know, of that whole getting better every day thing. You know, and as we touched on in an earlier podcast, one of the best ways to improve is find areas where you can maximize that relative change. And to me, this is kind of where mastering a skill to the point that you can practically apply it and get a benefit from it, then moving on to another area to address another hole tends to really provide the most overall benefit. Yeah, I think you have to audit yourself fairly frequently. I know that that I do because the practical application really is the most important part. It's more important than, than the theory and, and all the reasons why and, and the concepts involved. And it's really easy to, to deep dive into the abstract theory. Yeah, you know, I, I completely agree, especially when it comes to, you know, getting better and making those improvements. You know, results and actions are definitely greater than knowledge alone when it comes to making, you know, strides towards getting better. You know, and as we said before, being effective is often more beneficial than being right. So I think it really does matter to come, like you said, that self audit and make sure that what you're trying to accrue is something you're actually subsequently taking action on and putting into practice. You nailed it too when you say we dabble. We're definitely dabblers uh, and in multiple disciplines as well. And that that's important to me because one, one of my greatest fears is like, you, you know, the story if, if all a man has is a hammer, then everything's a nail. And my I have this fear of being the man with the hammer. So deep diving and dabbling into multiple disciplines helps kind of guard against these cognitive biases that are inherent to people that really, really deep dive into just one discipline. Trevor, Trevor said it best one time, uh, Dr. Cash, he said something about understanding multiple disciplines, just the concepts and being able to reason from the ground up gives you a really, really strong and sensitive uh, BS meter. You know what happens if you have a toothache and you go to the chiropractor, <laughs> the chiropractor cracks your back. Yes. I'm a firm believer in having strong fundamental knowledge in things. And I think there's definitely confusion between fundamental knowledge and easy stuff, because ironically enough, the fundamentals of pretty much any subject I feel like are the absolutely most difficult concepts to grasp because they are overarching and really comprise entire belief systems and ways of studying and applying knowledge. That being said, if there is something, an idea that's presented to you, maybe in terms of business, let's say, okay? And I'm no business scientist, but I'm still going to use this as an example, where if maybe you have mastered the art of business, so to speak, or science of business, you have started multiple businesses, started them off, you've done well for yourself by all standards and measures, you are a successful business person. If somebody presents a business idea to you, you will probably have a good idea as to whether or not it is feasible, even if you have never done that before. And that sort of thought process can be translated to pretty much any field where this person has an extremely strong background in business fundamentals and is presented with an idea that which he has never heard of before. But if he thought of himself starting from the bottom and working up to that idea that this person is presenting, 
that person is probably able to, with some reasonable accuracy, determine the viability of that idea. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think you can certainly tell when something doesn't make any sense at all. And yeah. that, that saves a lot of, of bandwidth when you just know it's, it's absolutely not going to work or doesn't make any sense. You know, I think uh, I think you really nailed it, though. Having a solid grasp on fundamentals, people like to 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 kind of slag on fundamentals and want to get into more esoteric and elevated concepts. But really, as you said, the fundamentals of any discipline. I mean, that's really what you build your foundation on. And you guys all know how big supporters are. We have that solid foundation. Try to get into a completely new field. Those basics are going to be again probably the most difficult thing you've had to expose yourself to in quite some time. And I think that is where it kind of does get a little bit um, muddied, so to speak, when people are like, well, I really don't want to start over at the basics. It's like, no, the basics is where you need to be your strongest. Going back to that, uh, you know, when all you have is a hammer, all the world's a nail thing. Uh, basically, for years, I was that guy trying to use a hammer on everything. And it really exposed me to some of those cognitive biases you mentioned. And it really started me, you know, thinking along the lines of like, you know, tools in the toolbox are never a bad thing. But the key to me, you know, and this kind of goes back again to the to the basics and the foundation is, you know, when it comes to tools in your toolbox, the key is just not collecting them for the sake of having them, but in actually developing enough skill or mastery with them to successfully implement them and put them into use. You know, knowing when to pull out a crescent wrench versus knowing when to pull out a torque wrench, two totally different applications, even though the name says wrench in both of them. You know, and to me, I guess this means first recognizing the need for a new tool, you know, second, determining the situation where it's appropriate, and finally, how to deploy it effectively. And, you know, thinking about that it kind of it kind of brings up a pretty good point and and that's how do you know when enough is enough you know when when do you know that you've accrued enough information for practical application and, and to me it's a question that falls back on the purpose and nick i know you're you're kind of a a pretty big robert green fan and i've heard you describe the cycle or steps of mastery pretty dang well um i don't know if you want to go into that a little bit we could jam on it see see where it goes or whatever but i know it's it's pretty interesting when you start thinking about how mastery actually takes place through through all the different phases. There's multiple tiers where it's learning the skill and then there's doing the skill. And then, of course, there's doing the skill so well the rest of the world changes its rules around that skill. But for the sake of just the practical application, there's probably three steps to be cognizant of. The first one being tedium, just the, the labor that goes into learning a new skill. And I know you're a guitar player, so if I think of like, okay, what's the tedium involved with guitar playing? Uh, it's learning how to read music, maybe learning which string is which. I don't know. I've never learned. I've never played a guitar. Yeah, yeah there's definitely some tedious parts. And, and ask me to read music, and you're going to get a blank stare. But yeah, basic chord structure, strumming patterns, all of these things that don't equate to you know hair whipping and, and, and jamming in your underwear, you know, and rocking out in front of 20,000 people. There's a lot you have to put into where, you know, before it actually becomes anything more than just making noise. Well, I've seen, I've seen the fingers of somebody that's learning to play guitar too. That doesn't look like a lot of fun. So I think the tedium is the point where you look at a skill like copywriting, uh, playing guitar, playing piano, whatever Trevor does in a lab that looks like it's a lot of fun blowing things up. It, it's that part where you start doing it and you say, this is not nearly as much fun as it looked like when he does it. And, and that's, the, I think that's the tedium part, right? And that's the part that everybody of, tries to avoid or bypass. And the next step would be what, what Robert Greene calls the cycle of accelerated returns. And that just means you do it until you're good enough at it that it kind of starts to be fun. And because it's fun, you do it a little bit more and you get a little bit better at it, a little bit faster. And therefore, you do it a little bit more. And the, the speed of the skill acquisition increases until you reach that third step, which is you're kind of unconsciously competent. You just know how to do it. But that's the last step for the practical application. Obviously, there's how do you explain how you do it? How do you teach other people how to do it? Yada, yada, yada. Uh, but that is a, that's probably a whole nother episode. I think Jonathan posed a question, how do you know when enough is enough? And I think the first question to ask in a situation like that is, uh, what are you trying to do and has someone else done it before? 
And chances are what you want to accomplish is something that somebody else has accomplished at some point, which is not inherently good or bad. It just is because doing entirely new things that no other human has ever done before is not the most common thing in the world. So determining what amount of effort or how much mastery is required is almost directly comparable to what another person has done that is in a position you want to be in. And then you have the advantage of going through and taking all of the useful pieces out of that person's experiences to really accelerate your own journey to that spot. I think that is something that uh, is definitely useful in terms of RD and why we use measurements and uh, because there is nothing new about what is going on. And there's a reason why there are systems in place the way they are. And the amount of mastery that is required to reach the next step of how the program is facilitated is already structured. So I think in, in terms of business, I just think it's cool how that sort of stuff is kind of integrated on accident. I know that the business uh, puts, puts members through a lot of what are called like engineered aha moments where there's some things that a person really may not have absorbed after being told a thousand times, you know, like eat your vegetables. And then one day they're like, oh my goodness, vegetables are amazing. Well, we've been telling you that for forever, but really it's just, you kind of have to walk before you can run. And then, you know, we'll, we'll probably touch on this in later episodes, but there's this really concept of if you're starting out at a level of mastery that's not as appropriate to you, the chances of you really getting to that accelerated point of accelerated returns is probably minimum. I'm not as familiar with Robert Greene's philosophy. I think that's, that's the name you said, but uh, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to bet that going out of order probably is not along the lines of effective. The reason why is not nearly as important in the beginning, I think, is just doing it. Like understanding why, it's kind of like riding a bike. It's that whole can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar thing. That's kind of the the reason why I say, hey, can you follow these instructions? It it doesn't, the, the science doesn't really matter right now. And that's part of the purpose, right? Why, why do you want to master, for, in the sake of RD, why do you want to master this skill? So you look better naked, cool, do this. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, with RD, this is something we've found time and time and time again. Do you want to know why or do you want results? You know, again, thousands of people that we worked with over the years, we found, I, I don't know, Trevor can correct me if you want, but there is virtually no need for the dissemination of science when it comes to the practical application of improving your body composition. You know, literally close to zero, if not actually zero reason for it. You know, uh, do, do you want to know how the pancreas works or do you want to feel better, move better and look better naked? Those are two totally separate goals and one does not necessarily equal the other. You know, and, and I think it comes down to awareness and purpose, you know, knowledge for the sake of accruing it or satisfying curiosity simply doesn't impact the way results or doesn't impact your results in the way that adherence and consistency through following a plan does when, you know, especially when it comes to RD, much like getting a particular revo result for yourself doesn't mean you can transfer that success to another individual. To, and to be honest, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't, it's shouldn't be. If your goal isn't to teach or explain a process to begin with, why would you expect going through a process to give you that skill set? You know, progressing from doing it to teaching it would be a lot of time that might better serve you if you put it into other endeavors rather than trying to learn the science behind something if you don't want to be a scientist. Yeah, I would, I would also like to stipulate that when we're talking about like why, uh, why you're doing something is important. What we are referencing, I'm pretty sure, is like, why does this work? I, I do want to stipulate that is the why we are talking about, like how to do something versus how it works are not the same. And we are definitely referencing that the how it works is not necessarily important in the context of, of you progressing. So I just thought like I can see I, I got confused for a second. So I thought I would bring that up. <laughs> yeah, we kind of do throw the why, know your why around a little bit too, a little Simon Sinek there. But yeah, absolutely. The how. The, the yeah. do it or do you want to know how it works? It's not knowing how a clock works doesn't help you tell time. If you're ready to get the body you desire without depriving yourself of the foods you enjoy, download your free diet playbook now at www.relentlesspodcast.com. So, so the question then, because I'm, I, I watched it firsthand. I sat in an office with you guys and I, I wasn't as involved in the actual process of 
fulfillment, like delivery to our members. How did you two master the art of getting people to do what they need to do and not spend all day explaining how it works? Like the tedium, I just like to hear you guys go back and forth on on that process because it, it was super interesting to watch. There was definitely a lot of that tedium, working with people and being really frustrated in the beginning involved. This is actually an interesting situation where I was kind of smacked in the face for not following, you know, really how I have, I guess, identified myself and my own philosophy from working from the bottom up. And in this case, you know, when we first started, I legitimately thought that I was working from the bottom, right? I am a biochemist, I think, in terms of molecules. Therefore, that is the bottom, right? And, you know, so people were suggested to eat things in terms of molecules, so to speak. This many proteins, carbohydrates, fats, etc. And for certain populations, this just was not cutting the mustard. And it turns out that... Regressing even further, there are things that are more basic, and there are things that are more basic, and there are things that are more basic. So the interesting thing is that, in my opinion, from where I stood and the people that I had consulted at the time, I was at the base level, right? And you start at the bottom and work up. But as we got exposed to other people, we realized that the minimum level is actually way further below than what I thought it was. So the tedium involved was making iterations of a program that really changed based off of whoever a member came on, did they break the system? <laughs> and at what point was that system broken? And then how do we how do we change that for the next for the next flock of people that come through to test out the new one? This is the tedium part, right? Where I think Jonathan, you moved from Arizona and Jonathan moved over from Lakeland and we said, ah, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun. And then this is the point where maybe we said, this is not as much fun as it seemed like it would be. Yeah, I think I think tedium is a great word for it. And and as Trevor pointed out, it was just a, a day after day, uh, email after email, a thousand people later, we thought we found the bottom and lo and behold, we had not struck bottom yet. And, uh, and that was it. You know, you put the reps in and you keep digging back and you keep searching for the, the lowest common denominator and the way to convey the message enough. And we all thought we all started at the same place. We started at Trevor's bottom and we thought that's where the rest of the world would beat us. And uh, we, we really found out, uh, I don't even want to say quickly, we uh, surprised how, how uh, much we kept peeling back to find those layers. And that, that really was a, a, pretty, a pretty arduous time where, like you said, Nick, we thought it was going to be just a big hoot and we were going to be party on the beach every day day and uh, we had to dig deep and put put some hours into it it was uh it was pretty interesting i don't know if i coined the term a lot but i i like to use the term uh, base knowledge disconnect where like nick was talking about knowing some things well enough it just becomes intuitive and you kind of expect everybody else to know what the hell you're talking about i was definitely at that stage where like to me something was just so insanely basic and i didn't take into account that i had been staring at the same stuff for like 15 years so that was really, like I said, an interesting like dropkick in the face to me because so many people are focused on the newest and shiniest and most cutting edge thing. But the reality is that that is not super useful. And in the context of really running a business and finding what is efficient and productive, then going the route of what the hell you can actually use is really the most important. And ironically enough, it wasn't the cutting edge. It was the blunt edge, the edge that had been used so many goddamn times, people have forgot about it. The bluntest edge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is no longer slight. <laughs> no, no. It's like, like barely sloped. Oh, yeah. Man. I think I know, but where – for you guys building out the the actual like day-to-day check-ins, would you say there was a cycle of Accelerate where it started being fun? Like when did they start clicking and saying, hey, we're doing something new. This isn't so freaking horrible anymore. Uh, do you have a point or is it just a, a range of of time where you felt like you were hitting that uh, that, that cycle? I'm starting first because Jonathan is, is going to be grittier than me. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that, that's just because he's been in the dirt in this context a little bit longer. So what I have noticed is the swapping point for me specifically is not 
uh, how do we get this person to understand what we are saying, but how do we set this person up to succeed? And those are two very different things. And once that sort of philosophy clicked with me, um, I was able to approach the development of this process with Jonathan at a severely different angle. So with that being said, I'll let Jonathan get into his chunk, but I just wanted to lay that out. No, that that was absolutely the litmus test when we started realizing that uh, maybe we need to to educate a little bit less and listen a whole lot more. Um, it, it really started to start clicking and making sense. And I think for me, the major catalyst was for that was we started working with a incredibly different segment of the population from what the three of us would consider ourselves and people we had worked with in the past. And uh Again, that base knowledge disconnect, as Trevor pointed out, is about the best way to explain it. You know, we had always worked with people in the past that maybe didn't understand things at the fundamental level like like I did, especially like Dr. Cash, didn't understand. But we kind of had ways to distill that knowledge into human speak and kind of get the point across. But we started working with a, with a local uh, service provider around here who had a pretty uh, interesting uh, variety of clientele. And when we started working with with their clients – it really kind of like Trevor said, broke the system. We started seeing how much things didn't work. And that's when about at the same time, Trevor started realizing like, Hey, maybe we need to kind of not educate people on the plan, but find plans that fit them and fit their lifestyle. And uh, we really, again, started peeling back layers. How far can we reduce this system to make it make sense? What's the absolute minimum amount of measurements we can take, amount of feedback we can request, amount of questions we can have answered, you know, as well as what can we do to distill this knowledge in more palatable forms that that you know touch people's different learning methods, whether it's reading, whether it's audiovisual, whether it's kinesthetic, bring someone into the office. What can we do to really kind of meet people where they're at? And I think once we started doing that, um, you know, it's not necessarily the cycle of returns were immediate because we are in a business that, you know, Nick, as you like to say, has a long tail and it takes a while for people to realize we're helping them sometimes. But it started becoming a lot more fun for us because I think we were doing something new. And and I think that's kind of, you know, it, it really kind of clicked for us. Like we, we really did want to kind of charter into some unknown territory and kind of be some pioneers in that regard. And that really, I think, got us all out of bed a little bit quicker every morning so we could get to office and brainstorm on this stuff. Yeah, it was kind of like people were coming to us saying, I don't know how to read. Can you teach me? So I said, here's a book on how to read. We'll meet next week. <laughs> yeah. So we had a surprising success rate, though, with that method. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, considering, I mean, it's, it's a lot of working backwards instead of working forwards. So now it's just we keep trying to figure out what is what is the bottom and then really a person gets accelerated at a rate that is appropriate for them versus trying to have a person play catch up and it, it has worked i think fantastically i mean there there's nothing else like it but that's now we have this skill right i think the three of us can probably have a conversation with somebody and and have a pretty good idea of how to set them up for success almost immediately. And that's that tacit knowledge, just the, the, the skill. And it's a tacit knowledge that, you know, you know it, but maybe you can't quite explain it. And, and we can get into how we trained other people to realize this another time. Cause that's a whole nother episode. That, that's the process of, of mastery to the point of practical application is that tedium, uh, the, the cycle of returns, which like you guys said, can just be a, a perspective switch, which I never really thought of before, but it makes perfect sense. I think that's why we're so passionate to a degree on this, you know, mastery to the point of practical application is because that's where we realize that's where the magic happens. We don't have to get everybody to point Z when to go from a to B, that's where they need to be at. So we can meet them there, get them to be able to practically apply the biggest, you know, base level of change that's going to provide the most immediate and most impactful result and not worry about anything else. That's why we said there's absolutely zero need for the dissemination of science. You do not need to know where the islets of Langerhans are located to be able to measure and manage your nutrition and make progress. And a lot of people think they do. And I think that's what this system, you know, has proven at least to us and proven to the people that, that stick with it is, you know, let's keep the main thing, the main thing. 
And let's let's make sure you can demonstrably master this step before you worry about what's next. And again, I think that's that's where you find, you know, the magic happens is that that mastery to the point of practical application. And if you need to go further, great, go further. If you don't, again, what's your purpose for the behavior? That is exactly correct. And I would like to point out is that there there is it is reasonable to say that you need to have something mastered before you can apply it and or require a, a high level of mastery to justify implementing methods. And I do want to say that like mastery for the sake of mastery, as Jonathan has said multiple times, it is not practical at all. However, I do want to point out that the practicality of any system or method, <laughs> it, was it was devised by a person who mastered something for the sake of mastering it. Yes. Right. So I do want to point out that's kind of why I brought it up before. Like, has a person accomplished what you've already wanted to accomplish? If that's the case, and if it's been done on a massive scale, then mastery for the sake of mastery doesn't even need to be on the table at all. But if your whole purpose is to try and devise a system that hasn't been developed before, then you're going to have to put in that 10 years of work so that other people can learn it all in one. And that, and that's exactly where we found ourselves at, you know, putting years of experience in different fields together to create something that hasn't been created. And, you know, I'll, I'll a hundred percent vouch for mastery for the sake of mastery in certain endeavors for sure. And I think we could go into a whole nother show on, on when that's applicable and why you'd want to pursue that too, because yeah, there's no doubt that if you want to be a pioneer or if it's required for you to reach a level that, yeah, you're going to have to do the work. Like we said in the last episode, if you want your PhD in biochemistry, well, guess what? You're going to have to spend that, spend the hours in. If you just want to look better naked, you probably don't need that. I do want to point out too that once you're an expert in one field, it's kind of like learning languages. It's easier, not easier to become an expert in others per se, but being able to absorb higher level material is is uh, a little more a little more palatable because you find that once you become a high level in any field, once you get to the so-called cutting edge, it becomes inherently interdisciplinary, right? So once you become a super high level, I don't know. I guess, portrait artist with a pencil. It gets to a point you go, you know what? I wonder what it's like to experiment with this method. And then the big E word comes out, experiment. And then it turns out, oh shit, somebody has used a paintbrush before? This is crazy. And then before you know it, you start integrating methods and fundamentals from other fields that you may have not considered before. But you're in the position in the field that you're in to start integrating things from other fields. So it's kind of like growing a tree instead of growing a bush, right? Like you got a big strong trunk and then when the trunk gets high enough, you start making branches. And that's, that's one of the metaphors that I like to use because biochemistry itself, ironically enough, is an interdisciplinary field. But even it becomes more nuanced than that when you get into a high enough level of biochemistry, you start being exposed to parts of engineering. You start getting exposed to parts of public health. And it just like I like mastery for the sake of mastery for my own sake, because when you get to a high enough level in a field, you are exposed to other fields by default instead of instead of trying to kind of tootle around and figure out what's interesting next. If you find something that you like to do, where mastery for the sake of mastery is something that is relevant, at least in my opinion, then you end up exposing yourself to different fields on accident without really floundering around like a lot of people do. Now, this is separate from like managing your calories, but I still think in terms of life stuff, this is at least how I operate and I, I enjoy myself okay. The multi disciplinary thing i think is a whole nother we have like 15 episodes in this one episode yeah, um, absolutely so this this episode is actually a table of contents for the next yep. season <laughs> there you go you know there's a there's a reason that after a 10-year hiatus i'm back on the mat doing brazilian jiu-jitsu because mastery for the sake of mastery and that art is worth the, the next 20 years of my life i love it when you do get expert status at jiu-jitsu I'm sure a lot of people start incorporating things from other styles, even if it's on accident. Sure. Like you said, it becomes that experiment and that art. Um, but always be, be cognizant, too, that transference, an expert in one field, for instance, as you pointed out, an expert pencil artist 
probably is not going to be able to transfer that skill to something physical like Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something intellectual like metabolic chemistry. So again, you got to kind of watch where your tree's growing. A tree can't turn into a cactus or turn into a bird, you know, so it's always kind of interesting too to be cognizant of transference as well. Oh, no, An expert this, this in one is field. Why, uh... <laughs> yeah, is it necessarily yeah. another? Oh, hell no. This is why so many Nobel Prize winners, like they go crazy. Because they're like, okay, you're the world's smartest person in this one thing that's a paragraph in a textbook, right? And then all of a sudden, like, your opinion matters in so many other fields than your own. And people literally go crazy. So, I mean, (laughs) everybody sees it. Like, you get famous, and now all of a sudden, your opinions and ideas are kind of, like, interjected everywhere and now have some form of... Of, of weight. That's that's for another non-alcoholic beer. But yeah, it's de- it can definitely be cancerous. <laughs> Absolutely. So moral of the story, stay in your lane. <laughs> You've been listening to the Relentless Podcast. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to keep getting a little bit better every day, do us a favor, head over to iTunes, subscribe, Leave us an honest review and be sure not to miss the next one. This is the podcastfactory.com.